every year, first weekend in October, we do the fall festival at the folk school. And all of a sudden, Brasstown, which has normally got uh, 53 people in it, all of a sudden has 18,000 people. Lots of food, there's lots of music in two stages, and one of the biggest things that happens is that the, the Morris team does a performance in the festival barn. And that's probably the height of the whole festival. For the local people, that's the one place they know they can see this Morris dance thing that they've heard of. It's so much fun the way people want to have your picture taken with you. And it's, our big joke is we're just sneaking around. You know, there's no way you can sneak around <laughs> in bells and rags. I mean, we work the hardest for Fall Festival because we just know it's going to be a big audience. And so we try to polish our dances that have been resting all summer, make sure everybody's kits are in good order. So I don't know what else to say about Fall Festival. Morris dancing is about hit or miss in the streets. You know, they're there one minute, they're gone the next. These crazy people come onto your street for a few minutes and, you know, if you don't know what's going on, you have to stop and say, what? This is a community in which people are looking for things to do. You know, if you don't want to go to church on Wednesday night, the only other thing to do is to go Morris dancing. I think the desire of more than men to find some roots in something that is not a computer, that is not more than, that fills some other niche in a, in a human being's uh, desires and, and, and wishes. I could not believe how much fun it is to be there with a bunch of people in sticks and banging them together. When the music starts, I forget about everything. <laughs> so let's do it for 12, yeah. and then you can call it for 8. All right, here we go. From the beginning. Nice diamonds, and not so close to your people that you're going to get them with your sleeves. Yeah. Okay, here we go. From the beginning. Let's do it. Being, a, you know, a girl who was not really, didn't have the right kind of body type to do classic ballet or, you know, that kind of stuff, but always wanting to dance. And when came to Brass Town, came to the folk school and saw that just there was regular dance for everybody. It didn't matter, you know, what kind of person you were. You could do it, what age you were. I'm Nanette Davidson. I'm a squire of Dames Rocket Northwest Clog Morris, which is one of the Brasstown Morris dancer teams that we have here in Brasstown. There are four teams and a big band. I was a founding member of the Rural Felicity Garland team, which is part of our Brasstown Morris dancers that's now 33 years old. So I guess, I guess my, uh, since 1982, I've been a Morris dancer. And I was, on, I was a founding member of the Border Morris team here too. The thing about Morris dancing that's so fun is that you are creating group art basically with a group of people that you're interacting with over a long period of time. And it's kind of, it's like, it's like being on a Girl Scout team without, you know, it's like you have your, your group that you're, that you're hanging out with, which makes it different from community dance where you come in and dance for a couple hours and you dance with whoever's there and you leave. But the other thing that makes Morris dancing really important to me is that I love to do this, this country dance and it's couple dancing, it's partner dancing, 
and I have this awesome musical husband who will not dance. With Boris dancing, I can dance with my girls. <laughs> So what you do to make yarn is first you feed the sheep for one year <laughs> and you don't let anything get in and kill it. Then you give the sheep a haircut over its whole body. And so now you have a big heap of wool, anywhere from 2 to 12 pounds of wool, depending on the breed and the size of the animal. So you have all this greasy stuff that looks like what was on a sheep and it has to get washed then. After it's washed and dried, then I pick it apart, I card it, which is like wire brushes, uh, then I spin it on my spinning wheel, then I decide what I want to make from it. And I'm a knitter. So I'm raising sheep specifically for knitting. If my parents had known what was going to happen, I don't think my mother would have given me a spinning wheel. So that's where it all started. She got an old spinning wheel from my great aunt who lived in Gainesville, Georgia. I don't know why my aunt had the wheel. I think just for antique decoration, something like that. So she got it and she gave it to me and she put it in front of me and she said, there, you always did like weird stuff. And I didn't know what to do with it. I could see kind of where your foot needed to go and that it had this wheel that turned around, but I had never seen spinning. I didn't know anything about it. So my grandmother had the newspaper and said, look here, they're having a class at the John C. Campbell Folk School. Why don't you go down and learn? So that was sort of 1978. I got married in 1979, had sheep by 1980. It's completely captivated me. It was a good choice for me. And so I've had sheep all these years. My name is Martha Owen and I'm the queen mom. <laughs> So basically what I do uh, every week is I'm running the Border Morris practice. We're including the ground team and the Rockets as mixed dancers in one dance, which is Tinder Rep. Okay? So that means we have three dances per performance that are all sticks. But I'm also the only one that dances with all the groups, so in some ways I, I think of myself as a connector to all the groups, a liaison, I guess. But I don't boss everybody, and honestly you can't boss the sticks in the mud, so it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just for exercise that I tell them what to do. It's made it so I can still sing lots of high notes, you know, hollering at them. I love to dance, and in fact my first times coming to the folk school was through dancing. And there was a woman there named Nancy Anna Lefevre. So Nancy Anna approached me about joining this group that was going to do an old style English sword dance, meaning we're dancing with long wooden swords. And I said, well, maybe. So I talked to David about it because at that point I had a nursling. My third child was still nursing. And I said, I only want to go if I can like go for the whole thing. He said, okay. But anyway, Nancy Ann invited me, and then uh, that was pretty fun. So then she said, why don't you join the Garland team? And that's how I started with the Garland team. Started going every Wednesday and have always continued. <laughs>
Sometimes when I am feeling really overwhelmed, I wish I had my Wednesday back, but that's totally normal. Um, but as I say, once the music starts, I forget about sore places or places I was thinking I had to go or jobs I had to do. So it's just, it's just a part of my week, my life, my blood, you know. I used to joke and tell people that one day I'm just going to drop out and become a potter. And for Christmas, there were three couples of us who would get together at Christmas time and have dinner and exchange gag gifts. It had to be $25 or less. I was in the D.C. area and one of the couples, he was a hydraulic mechanic on Air Force One and she worked in the craft shop at Andrews Air Force Base. And uh, there was uh, going to be a pottery class, four classes for $25, and that was my gift. You know, what started as a joke turned out to be a new direction in life. And from the moment I touched clay on the wheel, it was like I had been gone from home a long time and had come back to something very familiar. And I knew from then on that this was going to be um, one of the driving forces of who I am. Now that's funky. <laughs> when um, I moved here, I was in the midst of a crisis in my life. Part of moving here, I made the decision that I wanted to play more. And so when I came, I started going to the dances at the folk school. Prior to my coming here, I used to tell people that I would rather eat ground glass than dance. But when I came here, I decided I was putting away old things and taking on new things. And so dance was a part of the community, so dance was going to be a part of my life. I danced Tuesday nights, Saturday nights, and watch sticks, and I thought, you know, this is a really fun, playful group and I think I'd like to be a part of that. I am probably the person with the least amount of um, musical talent and um, rhythm, uh, but they still, you know, you know, let me play with them. I never thought I would join the Morris team because it was Harry's thing. He got here a year before I did. And so I really honored that was his, that was his thing. Um, and I'm, I didn't know that I would want to dress like anybody else. <laughs> but the sticks have these rowdy, rowdy jackets and it's just so much fun. And, and Martha told me you know, that I had always been invited to be part of the team. She said, pick up a stick and then tell me what you think. So I got on the dance floor that night and um, I was smitten. Could not believe how much fun it is to be there with a bunch of people in sticks and banging them together. You don't have a chance to think about anything else in the world other than which way you're supposed to go so that you don't get hit. Um, <laughs> and, and know how to hit your sticks together with somebody else and then um, to throw and not drop. So it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, first experience and from then on I haven't, I haven't turned back. I'm delighted to be part of this crowd. The founder of the folk school was uh, Olive Dame Campbell, and she was a pioneer folk song collector in Appalachia. She started in about 1907 to write down the words and the music of these ballads 
that she encountered in the uh, rural parts of the mountains. And Cecil Sharp was an Englishman who lived near Oxford, and he was the world's greatest expert on two things, one of which was the ballads. He had started collecting ballads from old folks in England in the early 20th century, and the other thing he was a big expert on was Morris dancing. So they wrote a ballad book in 1917, which is the book, English Folk Songs of Southern Appalachians. And because they were good friends and collaborators on this ballad book, Olive also got interested in Morris dancing. Now one of the things here going on at the folk school in the 1920s was that dancing, the local kind of dancing, was associated with uh, drinking and chair flinging and uh, fighting. fighting, yeah. So in order to offer dancing, they tried to find some dancing that had sort of neutral uh, or unknown cultural meaning. So there wasn't any particular local meaning to uh, English dances or Morris dances or Danish dances. So that's what they did. During the 1960s and 70s, I think it was very strong. Uh, there was a director at the folk school named John Ramsey, who was a, a Berea graduate, a former Berea country dancer, a very strong dance leader. And as director of the folk school, you know, dance played a really important role. And during that time, they had a group of young folks who are all now about my age, I think, maybe a little younger, who were, had a terrific Morris dance team. When the teenagers lived here, my three oldest t children, they were in high school at that point. And they started a group, and all of them were dancing, Morris dancing, but at this time, not the border Morris, but, but the other styles of Morris dancing. The, there was a renaissance of Morris dancing in the 1980s and a lot of new teams were born then and they were created by people in their 20s in the 1980s. I was one of those. And they created this structure of Morris dance both in England and in the United States and um, they um, st stuck with it. So there are people that have been dancing continuously for 30, you know, 30 plus years. Now the Garland dancers started in the 80s. That was a little bit before I came to the folk school. And I think they were started predominantly by a woman from England who came and was here for a while. In 1982, a lady from England came. Her name was Aline Phelan, and she started to say, you have to have a team. And then this lady came, the social person at the folk school, Laura Sprang. She started, called us together, and we started uh, garland dancing. Then after I came in 91, a group of them went over to England. It was just the garland dancers. But so the, the guys that went on that trip came back and said, we want to dance too. And uh, it just so happened at that time, we had a, a fellow from England who was um, a host at the folk school, Fred Ward. And we said, well, let's get Fred to teach us some dances. And uh, Fred got us started. Nanette started the, the uh, Dames Rocka team. That's our kind of our newest team. And I think she really wanted a, a group that was really gonna practice and really put together a strong performance. to come forward and share with us. But I might add at this time, following our talent show this evening, we will have some dancers coming doing a performance as well. So I think we've got an action-packed evening uh, with something to satisfy everybody. Mike, come on up. So one of our dancers is of Irish descent, and he loves to have parties. He decided that he wanted to have a, Saint, a community St. Patty's Day party that was similar to the parties that were in Boston, but was family friendly. But then he became a Morris dancer. 
So he just incorporated us into those parties, even though we're, Mara's dancing is not Irish at all. <laughs> it starts with a potluck and lots of Irish food. And then there's a talent show. We call it a talent show, but it's more of a open mic. And it's just a way for everybody to share a joke or a song or a dance. And then that's followed by performances of the uh, Morris dancers, the uh, Sticks in the Mud, the Garland dancers, the Rockets. I'm Brian Mitchell. I'm a physician in practice in medicine here in Murphy, North Carolina. I'm uh, originally from Boston. My father owned an Irish pub and growing up I worked there, had the experience of um, serving people uh, and hearing a lot of the Irish music. My father would go to the Irish fairs in Ireland every summer and recruit musicians to come to America and have them sing at the pub regularly. I very much missed it when I first came here to the mountains. And so, oh, a year or so after I arrived 40 years ago, I thought a St. Patrick's Day party would work for me and be enjoyed by the community. So we, we got together with, uh, with some friends and decided to put it on. And every St. Patrick's Day for probably 35, 36 years, we have a St. Patrick's Day celebration in Murphy. It's modeled after a, uh, an Irish experience called the Cayley, which is a family gathering of all folks in town where they bring together food and drink and stories and songs and music and share them with others. And uh, folks just love it. It's real popular. And we, we love to put it on for the community. May Day is a, a very old uh, seasonal event in places like England and here, the Maypole in this country used to be something that elementary school kids did. Folk schools always um, had May Day, almost all the time, and there's some great old pictures of, uh, well, me and Nanette in Maypole dancing <laughs> in 1981 or something. But Nanette really revived uh, the May Day celebration here because it's always a beautiful day, there's always people around, and it's a great opportunity to get the kids involved in something directly. So uh, uh, she sends out the word and tells everybody to go to the thrift shop, buy white clothes, show up on this date, we'll practice the maple. And so this brings in a whole bunch of people that, uh, that we haven't quite uh, pulled in yet, little kids and their parents. We have recently, uh, then it's turned it into a parade.
One thing we need to do is sing the May Day Carol, which is a tradition. It's an old, old carol, but if you've got the words and you're ready to sing it, let's go for it. Um, if you if you want to look over somebody's shoulder, you can come along if you don't know it, but sing loud if you do. So. So this is a no vehicle parade, you know, it's all on foot, it's all handcrafted and people just get so excited about it. You know, they just, they want to be in it, they want to watch it, they want to, you know, they just want to like touch it. I hope every year we can add another element to it and it's just a walk and parade, it's short. Uh, it's, a, it's a growing grassroots parade. But I think one of the things that is so important, the way that we, the reason why we get positive reactions when we go out is because it's pageantry and our society doesn't have a lot of pageantry. It's out of the box totally and it gives people a license to be silly and free and dress up crazy and not worry about it. And uh, I think that there's a need for that, a real need for that. Does anybody have any requests? Hips and legs and feet. So let's start out lying down on our backs. And feel free to put a blanket under your head or your knees if you'd like. And closing your eyes. Letting your arms rest by your sides. Palms up for receptivity or down for grounding. Begin to wiggle your fingers and toes. Staying connected to the breath as you begin to wake your body up again. My name is Hannah Levin, and I teach yoga at a couple different places in the community. And then I dance with Dames Rocket, and that's my dance team. When I moved here, I was like, I'm self-employed. I don't have like a work community. And so I was like, what do I do to meet people and to have that community and friendship? And everybody I talked to said, join a dance team. And so I wasn't sure what all the dance team options were. And so I went to a performance where all the dance teams were performing and was checking them out to see which one I might want to be on. And so after that, I said, I want to be on the Stripey Tights team. And that turned out to be Dame's Rocket. I wasn't at all familiar with Morris dancing, and it felt very foreign. <laughs> I thought I was in a different country the first time I saw it. Um, and yeah, and I saw Dame's Rocket, and it was just like, that looks like A, good exercise, and I like some exercise, B, fun and see awesome people. And I was like, I want to be a part of that. Oh, and D, stripey tights. And those are very cool. So I wanted to wear stripey tights.
I started Morris dancing in 2007, January of 2007. The day after I moved here, I think it was like, I moved in 2006, right after Thanksgiving. And my landlord and his wife at the time, you know, she was a garland dancer. And I didn't know anyone, <laughs> so she asked me to come to the folk school with her and if I wanted to go to the Christmas parade and I saw Morris dancers and it was just weird. It was so like nothing I'd ever seen before. There was a lot of middle-aged people and then teenage guys and I was blown away by it. I didn't know what to do but it just looked like fun <laughs> and I want to be involved in anything that looks fun. At that contra dance that night, I think I met Robert Forsyth. I had mentioned like what I saw that day, it looked so cool, and he was like, I'm a Morris dancer, and if you want to join the team, you can join the team, and I was like, really? And, I, and at the time, I didn't really think I wanted to do that, I was just like, yeah, it looks like fun, let me think about it. And he made sure, like he was very persistent, he was like, if you're interested, you know, we're taking new, new people in January, and he let me know, and so in when they started taking new people, I went and met Martha, and I tried it, and I liked it. We have fun, you know, we genuinely just care about each other and love to dance and fellowship. Trying to explain to someone what Morris dancing is, you can't do it. Like, there's no way. I don't know how to explain that. I'm like, it's a little clown meets mock battle, and I'm just like, here's a YouTube link, you, you know, like, if you're really interested. YouTube it because you can't really explain it. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. This weekend for our mini ale, um, Dames Rocket needed to raise some money to go to uh, an ale in Toronto, which we're excited about because we've never, as a single team, we've never been to an ale. And an ale is a gathering of multiple Morris teams. So we gathered here at our house and with about six of Dame's Rockets and we made mm, 13, 13 pies in two and a half hours. Does anybody else make them too? I have no idea what anybody else is making. I only know what we're making. Allison's making a chocolate vegan gluten-free pie. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'll probably eat. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! It's working, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> Apple's getting brown even as we eat. afterwards and people bought some whole pies too we were able to sell whole pies but it was crazy but it was fun my name is Bob Dalsmer I'm uh, I've been retired for a couple years as music and dance coordinator at the folk school I am uh, 
kind of the accordion player, one of the accordion players anyway. Um, I feel like I'm the one that kind of tries to keep the band more or less together. One of the things that's really great about the Morris Band is we do practice every week. We have the same group of people, we get together, we play. It gets pretty boring sometimes sitting around waiting for them to walk through whatever they're going to do and we sit there twiddling our thumbs and then we get to play for 30 seconds. But, um, but we do play every week and it really shows. I mean last night for example when we played for the team um, we were up there on the stage with no monitors and we really couldn't hear each other but we've been playing together for so long that it's almost intuitive. You know everybody kind of falls in with a rhythm and um, it's, uh, it's a great feeling. Uh, what would you say you enjoy the most about being in the band? Uh, the camaraderie of the band. I mean, there's, there's right now, I don't know, five or six of us, I guess. I'd have to sit down and count them all up. But we laugh and joke, so we have lots of time to catch up with each other and see what they're doing and, and laugh. Uh, Jan Davison, who's the director here at the school, he, he's a, a fiddler in the group, and uh, we're always telling jokes back and forth to each other. I uh, play the melodeon and the plastic, the red plastic trombone for the um, for the sticks and the dame's rockets, and um, I play concertina for the um, um, uh, garland dancers. The the, the rockets do this um, uh, this tune. Um, and I'm having trouble thinking of the name of it, but it's the Buddy Holly. It's a Buddy Holly tune, um, and it just, it just absolutely fits the trombone. It's like it was written for it. And likewise, they're also doing a ribbon dance that uses um, by mere Bistuchin, Shun, which is not at all a Northwest English <laughs> uh, dance tune number. But again, it absolutely is perfect for the trombone. <laughs> You might have to cut this. As one of, the, one of the other man members once told me, he says, he says, yeah, he says it adds this wonderful farting sound to the dance, which I take great pride in. <laughs> you don't often get a compliment like that. He meant it in a complimentary way, so. <laughs>
We take the summer off. We, we're off from June to the middle of August, and then we kind of hit the ground running when we come back because we do try to do our best. Um, I mean, we work the hardest for Fall Festival. It's a highlight of performance of the year. Mm -hmm. um, we dance in the afternoon on both days, and um, our performance is very well received by the people that attend, and we show up very well for that. You go into it knowing that you've got to get over being shy and worried about your ability to jump high or keep smiling or because they came because they love you. And we just have this huge audience and they're so lovely. So we try to polish our dances that have been resting all summer, make sure everybody's kits are in good order. Fall Festival is also where uh, the dance teams have a food booth and where we're you know selling uh, things in order to raise money uh, for some of our travel. Uh, that is how we raise money, you know, to help uh, provide, you know, financial resources for folks, you know, to go to England. You know, the folk school's our mother. I think of Fall Festival as our Mother's Day. That's how we honor our mother, is by doing that food booth. So we make, you know, quite a bit of money and that that helps a lot with our travel. All right, so quick rundown about our booth, uh, food booth activities. We found out yesterday that we were going to receive 100 pounds of free beef from Brasstown Beef. And we have it in our hot little hands today. So hey. that was, uh, if you ever see Steve Whitmire, you can give him a big hug. And also, be, please buy beef from Brasstown Beef just down the road. Um, the other thing, uh, Ann has a sign-up sheet for work in the booth. If you are not already on that sheet, it would be a good idea for you to get on there. And what we need right now is people to help break down on Sunday night, and it's kind of a party in a way. The more hands, the better. And if you have not already got a booth scheduled uh, to work the booth, please get on there for breaking down and please really just help us get it down as fast as we can. And it was the bottle of curry powder fell out of the box and busted open in the back. So now I have the curry powder all over the back of the car.
drove to a dairy in Franklin yesterday to get milk for the cheese making class. We've got a class that's coming in Sunday night and they needed 60 gallons of, you know, unhomogenized, lightly pasteurized milk. So, had a big field trip yesterday. But this Cream Ridge, Spring Ridge Creamery buttermilk is the best buttermilk on the planet. I want you to taste it when the time comes. Okay. So what is going to, going to be in the Plowman's Lunch? Uh, the Plowman's Lunch is our local brass town beef braised in brown ale. And there is a salad in there, there is cheese, there is sourdough bread, and there is homemade chutney. So it's, an, it's a typical English plowman's lunch. And then we have a veggie version of it, which instead of the meat, it will have a chickpea curry, hence the curry powder. And uh, oat cakes is the gluten-free alternative. So we're trying to keep things British because of our Morris British dance style. So we can't serve barbecue <laughs> or hot dogs. <laughs> I don't want to anyway. <laughs> In about 1999, Jan decided that the folk school needed to offer cooking classes as a new craft curriculum. I had always had this huge passion for cooking and had worked in restaurants when I was in art school. So he asked me to set up that program and schedule instructors and so I started teaching classes through that. So we teach all kinds of bread baking classes, canning, making jams and chutneys, and it's all kinds of things. We make about 500 of these lunches, which is a drop in the bucket because we probably have 15,000 people to 17,000 that come to this event. So 500 is just feeding a few, but that's all we can handle. We got about 50 people in our group and probably 35 of them pitch in with the cooking. We have various captains that man different stations or women different stations. I'm making the chickpea curry. Carrots and ginger and onions and cilantro and chickpeas and curry. <laughs> The tougher cuts of meat are actually the more flavorful, but they have those tendons that need to break down, and it takes three hours to break those down. So when you braise meat, you brown it with um, some seasonings and some kind of oil, and then you pour some good liquid on it. It is a gluten-free sorghum ale and Worcestershire sauce and the deglazing of the pan. Cover it and slow cook it in the oven. You cook it for three hours at a low temperature and you can cook it longer if your temperature is even lower. So then it just makes it fork tender. You can almost cut it apart with a spoon. It's a lot of work, but we really love it. We love cooking together and it's, uh, we love eating together. We love feeding people. So it, it works into our, our scheme. Governor Pat McCrory has ordered state agencies to prepare for possible flooding ahead of the two weather systems. We do have flood warnings right now, primarily in the southeastern part of the state and in the far southwestern part of the state, something we didn't expect two days ago. It's hard to imagine after about six days already of rain that there's even more coming. Rain and wind from the storm system is adding to the already dangerous flood situation caused by a nor'easter in the mid-Atlantic states. It starts basically on Saturday morning and it, on Friday it was a monsoon. And we have these huge fields that uh, park, that where, where we park the 12,000 cars that come in for this and they were all flooded. And there's no place to park on, on hard dry ground for that number of people anywhere close by, especially not at the last minute.
And you stick these where? On the top of the flagpole? No, no. You know the, the light poles that have, have the oh. arms? They go on top. See, they're missing heads. Yes! But That's from the perfect. moment those things went up, I said they need jack-o'-lanterns. <laughs> that is yes. awesome. So the first year we did them, uh, we did them in secret. And then they just showed up Friday night, and then on Saturday, everybody shows up, and all these jack o' lanterns are sitting on top of them. And uh, so we went throughout most of the day without letting anybody know where they came from. And um, now more and more people know, mm -hmm. you know, where they come from. But they were just calling for jack o' lanterns. Oh, that's so awesome. Wait till you see them finished. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Cats and kittens. Here is the project. We have three pumpkins that need to be carved as jack-o'-lanterns. This year, uh, the emphasis is going to be on hair, on something that... So, Celia has brought this for one of them, and then I have gathered a bunch of stuff over there that can be used to kind of decorate the top as if it were hair. Yeah. And I have also on my iPad, I have some, you know, some jack-o'-lantern ideas. So if some of you, if you will divide yourself up and pick you a pumpkin and make some decisions about what you want okay to do. Uh, we have some large knives for cutting open and some smaller knives for carving you know, eyes and all of that. Um, so this is a time to relax and be free <laughs> and have fun. It's a sense of family. If the family draws you in and they want to find out what your potluck dish is and do you knit, do you play an instrument, and so on. For me, that's the biggest attraction of Brasstown and the atmosphere of learning and creative thinking that the folk school itself generates in this area. I'm David Vowell. I am a member of the fabulous band. I am the lone guitar player originally known as the bad guitar player, but uh, compared to all the others, I'm pretty good. The excitement of being part of multiple dance teams uh, just can't be measured. Uh, there's, there's not good words for it. You have to experience it. It's a big part of what makes uh, life delightful for me 
here as part of the folk school family. Being connected personally to one of the dancers, yes, it does give you a little extra bond. A lot of people think Cheryl and I are married. She's one of the Garland dancers. Uh, we've been together nine and a half years. We have always intended to get married. We're actually getting married in October. We often let people know that we have done the Cold Mountain Wedding. If you're familiar with the movie version, anyway, of Charles Fraser's book, you uh, hold hands, you look into each other's eyes, and you say, I marry you, I marry you, I marry you. And uh, in the mountains, that's good. What is tonight all about? <laughs> oh, this is Winter Dance Week at the Folk School. It's also New Year's Eve. I don't want to be anywhere else on New Year's, really. It just binds everybody together, everybody who wants to be here. It was really magical. Just the dance that night in general, the people dress up and it has the energy of a proper New Year's Eve celebration, I think. And then getting to perform, it's your last performance of the year, you know? It's funny because because of the holidays, we never seem to be able to practice much for that. It's like everybody's kind of been off for a couple of weeks. Uh, we haven't really performed for a while. We all feel kind of rusty, but somehow we get there and it's New Year's Eve and it's the folk school and it's just like magic. In a way, it, it, it kind of doesn't feel like uh, a year has passed unless it's like in the community room at the folk school. And I love Winter Dance Week. You're just dancing all morning, all afternoon, all night, all week. And by the end of the week, you're exhausted and blissed out. And you're with your family, our team, Brasstown Morris team, you know, we're all family. Why would you want to be anywhere else in the world? We found a, a house in Somerset, which is between Bath and Bristol, that will sleep 32 people. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun sort of sightseeing destination, so it might be our stop between the two festivals that we're planning to go perform at. Um, so that's fun. Well, I think we hear a little bit of noise back there, and this is something we normally hear at this time every, uh, every 52nd uh, Sunday of the year. Brasstown Morris dance teams, Sticks of the Mud, Dave's Rocket, and the band.
1996, so this is their 20th anniversary of dancing. Ooh, I bet they didn't even know that. And also, James Rocket, Northwest Clog Morris. Um, we were founded in about two, 2006, so it's our 10th anniversary. And also part of Rastown Morris Dancers that is not performing today is Rural Felicity Garland team who has actually been together for over 30 years. So we've been bringing Morris dance to this little Appalachian community for a good long time. And we're thrilled to say that we're gonna to travel to England this summer, 2017, to dance with a bunch of British Morris teams. There are hundreds of British Morris teams in England, only about maybe 50 in the US. So if you get a chance to support our trip by buying a scone or a bag of cookies or a stuffed jacket potato, we will be so appreciative. So the last dance we're going to do for you is a new dance for us, and it combines our two teams today. It's called Duck Race. Dance makes us all feel better. And we all know that about ourselves and about the group, that it makes, <laughs> it just makes everything better. It looks scary and why would I want to get up in front of a bunch of people in a crazy outfit? But when you're on the inside of it and uh, you're trained up, it's really fun to express yourself that way in public. We are a disparate group of people. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. Very few of us are from here. We come together on the dance team because we are dancers, and that is what we have in common. And our belief is that through dance, you know, we are able to, you know, to celebrate, you know, uh, and we are able to bring joy in our own lives and into the lives of others. Because we're connected as dancers, we also look out for each other and help when people are sick or when they need, you know, somebody to feed their chickens when they go on vacation or whatever it is, we, we hang together. I don't know, it's, it's more than dance, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There's like the circle of arms that's kind of around everybody here, within the dance community at least. Performance is not what we're about. We really like coming to practice and dancing together. And if we never perform for the public again, I think you would still find us dancing for each other every Wednesday night. Come on lads, let's be jolly, drive away all melancholy. For to grieve it would be folly. While we are together,
we take delight in. Take no 